Welcome and thank you sincerely for being here. I've put this course together to teach you the basics of electromagnetism, electromagnetic compatibility and printed circuit board design all in the same structure. I've been designing printed circuit boards for over seven years and my current role is Senior Principal Electronic Design Engineer at Cubic Transportation Systems. During my years in the industry, I've passed many products through electromagnetic compatibility tests and I found out that quite a lot of people don't really have any understanding about EMC. And I sort of blame universities for that because really they should provide some sort of knowledge to graduates or even beginner engineers about how to pass through LMC while it's being such an important part of the job really. Instead, universities teach none of this and they barely even teach printed circuit board design and when the engineer finally gets to do that kind of stuff they have no idea what's going on. So if this is the case for you, let's fix it now. Frankly, when I first started designing printed circuit boards, I had very little idea about the things I'm about to teach you. So I highly encourage you to start designing your own circuit boards, even if you don't fully understand the contents of this course, just so that you can build up your confidence. And confidence is the key, really, almost to anything. Electronic design is a highly rewarding career with flexible hours and very good salary. And what's the most important thing of all is that you see the results of your work straight away. You don't have to wait for years and years to see the benefits of your work because you just see them now. And let's face it, without hardware, we can hardly do anything. So it's a highly rewarding work, that's all I'm saying. So if you're not designing printed circuit boards for a living yet, then what are you even doing? Talk to your boss, talk to your professor, or just pick up a random project off internet and start doing it now. You won't regret it. And if you have any kind of question, just reach out to me, I'm here to help. Message me on LinkedIn, on my YouTube channel, or via my website, and I'll try to come back to you as soon as possible. Anyway, enough of this, let's crack on with the rest of the course. So we're going to begin with a bit of an introduction to definitions of uh, electromagnetic compatibility and related concepts. So if you're already quite familiar with this sort of thing, then by all means feel free to skip this part. But I do encourage you to at least briefly listen to it, even if you are quite a bit experienced, because sometimes it really helps to just listen to the same things you already know, but from another perspective. First, let's talk about printed circuit boards. And what a PCB is really, is a piece of dielectric material, which is usually FR4 fiberglass, and is usually 1.6 millimeter or 63 mil in thickness. It can be rigid, it can be flexible, or it can be a mixture of that. But really, it's not that restricted. It can be made of RF type of material such as Rogers or it can even be made of glass. It really doesn't matter all that much what it's made of but it has to be dielectric in the middle and it has to have some copper traces on the outer layers or inner layers for that matter. And we call the copper layers circuits and this is why it's printed and this is why it's circuit and this is why it's a board. A PCB also contains transitions between layers that we call wires, and there can be many transitions and many layers, as there can be 2, 4, 8, 16, 32 layers. It really is up to the manufacturer how delicate is the process but it can get really sophisticated those days. The other thing that often confuses people is that PCBs may or may not contain any components. Components are not essential to printed circuit boards as a PCB can be simply an interconnect or it can have an antenna, it will still be a PCB. There are many types of components that can be found on an average PCB. 
which would typically include integrated circuits such as operational amplifiers, shift registers, microcontrollers and so on. And then we can also find active or passive discrete components where discrete means singular. So that is a singular element component such as transistor, which would be an example of an active component and capacitor or resistor or inductor or diode, which would be all examples of a passive component. As well as those, we get crystal oscillators on a PCB, which is a separate kind of niche component, and it will come back to us in this course, as this is a very important part for containing emissions. Finally, we get connectors, mechanical parts, LEDs, buttons, and things like that. Those are typically less of a concern, but we do have to know how to deal with them as well. The main point I'm really getting to here is that a printed circuit board is really an organism. It's a very delicate ecosystem in which every part is responsible for different function. And if one of those parts stops its function, then the entire PCB can die and become basically garbage. So health checks are just as important to printed circuit boards as they are to humans. And doing EMC checks is one of those things. What makes a PCB different from biological organisms is that it is only alive when there is a movement of particles going through it, which we call electric current. And we're going to come back to this definition many times in this course. This is super important. So how do we analyze printed circuit boards? Well, I hope by now you have heard of Ohm's law. What Ohm's law really is, is the relationship between electric current, voltage and resistance. And it can be illustrated as it's shown on a picture here, which is a little funny one, but uh, you can see how the evil ohm is holding back the amp and the volt is trying to push the amp, but the ohm is really tightening the rope and it's holding it and it's just not letting it through, you know, and this is kind of how you can imagine. What is really wrong with Ohm's law though is that it does not change with time. And this is crucial because it only holds for circuits that contain resistive elements. And those would typically be the kind of circuits you'll find in a housing or some sort of a wiring systems. Basically, they will contain uh, a lot of resistance for wires and not much else. But when you consider real world circuits on a printed circuit board, they contain much more than that. They will contain inductors, they will contain capacitors, they will contain transmission lines. All of those things cannot be analyzed with Ohm's law anymore because they change with time. So this is a problem that in the universities and uh, other degrees, people don't normally get taught this kind of advanced level stuff. And instead they just get taught Ohm's law because it's simple and then they start thinking about circuits in terms of Ohm's law only. Meanwhile, it does not explain how does electric current really originate. It does not explain how can electromagnetic wave travel through empty space. And it does not explain how does your unit fail electromagnetic compatibility test either. So this is why we need to do something a bit more advanced than that. But before we do exactly that and take a deep dive into electromagnetic theory, let's talk a little bit about history. As you may know, Michael Faraday was the first person who hypothesized that a moving magnetic field is really necessary to induce an electric current into nearby circuit. And he's proven that through his experiments and then he's built the first electromagnetic generator in 1831 by rotating a copper disc between the poles of a static magnet. It is kind of different to what is shown on the picture here because in this picture we are rotating the magnet and the coil is static, but you kind of get the same result and there are multiple ways of achieving that. What Michael Faraday didn't answer though is the origin of such fields and how does this action at distance actually happened. So James Clerk Maxwell 
was the first person to propose that visible light is in fact an electromagnetic phenomenon. And he has derived what's now known as Maxwell's equations in 1861 and 1862. Maxwell's equations show that changing magnetic fields produce changing electric fields and in turn changing electric fields produce changing magnetic fields and so on. And this is how electromagnetic wave propagation is possible in vacuum and empty space basically because the electromagnetic wave creates itself and it allows it to propagate and uh, this is how we can receive electromagnetic waves originating in a galaxy far, far away from us. With help of Maxwell's equations, we can analyze what's really happening and we can derive this definition that electric current results from a displacement of particles from an atom which is caused by external force that disturbs the state of equilibrium between negatively charged protons and positively charged electrons where an example of such force could be, in fact, the electromagnetic wave radiation. In other words, your circuit does not necessarily need this voltage pushing current through it and uh, this evil ohm holding it against the, and uh, so on and so forth. In fact, all it needs is a radiating electromagnetic field and it will work as well if the field is strong enough. So this is where this concept of a spooky action at distance really comes from and a lot of people in the industry don't really understand it because they just used to analyzing circuits with Ohm's law and do not consider Maxwell's equations at all. So that when they don't see this uh, voltage pushing the amp through the resistance they just don't understand what's really happening, but in fact, your average circuit has a combination of both. There is a combination of electromagnetic radiation and the classic uh, push-through, push-pull sort of circuitry where you do have this potential difference between objects and there is current flowing and there is actual movement of particles happening inside the wire. What you really need to take away from this is that time-varying electric current always creates electromagnetic waves and it is worth mentioning that again because this is extremely important to understand. But even though this happens and uh, changing magnetic fields always create electric fields like I said and vice versa, but it doesn't necessarily mean there is any actual movement of particles during electromagnetic radiation, which is really quite complicated and can only be explained by quantum theory. So I'm not going to teach you that in this class, but I will provide you some supplementary links if you would be interested. It is quite interesting though, and I would recommend you to have a look at it, because for example, from quantum point of view, there is no such thing as electric and magnetic fields, in fact, as this is just a manifestation of the same phenomena, and it only depends on when you look at it, that it looks like an electric field or like a magnetic field because we cannot take the measurement at the same time of both. So finally, let's talk about what we really want to talk about, which is electromagnetic compatibility itself. So electromagnetic radiation, as you probably know, can be quite harmful, not just to electronic devices, but also humans. So it is really necessary to have this sort of standardization about how much is too much. And when it is too much, we call it interference, and interference can be quite destructive. Just think about that hi-fi amplifier from 1980s that whenever you switch it on, it turns off your refrigerator, let's say, or causes another kind of disruption in the house. It used to be quite common back in those days because there was just no regulation about it whatsoever. So there are really two types of disturbance that matter, which is the radiated emissions and conducted emissions. While the radiated emissions is happening through the air, conducted emission is happening through wires. 
And the third component that is typically included in EMC is electrostatic discharge, which just happens from someone walking on a woolen floor and then touching a device. It's just a natural sort of phenomena, but we have to protect our devices against it. And this is why it's included in EMC. What may surprise you about ESD though, is the kind of voltage level that you can generate with just your fingers as it can be up to 25 kilovolts sometimes, depends on your reference point, but it will be minuscule in current and very short in duration. So as we talk about EMC, we must also talk about EMC regulations themselves, and there are different flavors of them. First of all, in the United States, we've got Federal Communications Commission, which specifically has 47 CFR Part 15 standard that sets limits for radiated and conducted emissions. It also provides guidance about how to measure the equipment and what kind of conditions should be observed in an echoic chamber. Every year, Federal Communications Commission takes 1% of devices off the market and puts them under the test in their own laboratory to make sure that they are compliant with the regulations. This 1% is selected on a random basis, so you may be lucky and your device will never be selected, or you may be selected several times in a row, you just never know. And if a device is found to be non-compliant, the FCC will politely ask you to remove this device off market and potentially issue you a huge fine. So in the European Union, we have a fairly similar situation with a CE marking process, where EMC is basically forming a part of that. The main directive for EMC is called 2014-30, which is the latest edition of that standard. In fact, this is not a standard, it's an umbrella of standards that includes all underlying standards for more specific applications. Those standards would be further subcategorized for relevant industries such as railways, industrial applications, or general consumer market. Bear in mind that military standards are different and are not part of CE which does not mean that you don't have to comply with EMC, you just will have a different standard. But the practices that I'm going to teach you in this course are going to apply to all of those industries. It is really just the limit line that is going to change. It may be sometimes slightly lower or slightly higher depending on the application. The rest of the world employs other standards such as UKCA, KCC for Korea, or ICS for Canada, but very often they reference the same standards that come from Europe or FCC, and usually it's just about moving the limit line. So from the point of view of electromagnetics, everything is the same, but you do have slightly different limit lines depending on application, on the country, and so on and so forth. So this is really the point that I want to make. You should design your products properly, regardless of what industry you're trying to sell them in, and then you will pass all those standards with ease. 